All right. We're going to uh, keep our, our series of bridging the gaps going. And uh, if you need a Bible, shoot your hand up. Someone will get a Bible to you. But we're going to keep our series going of bridging the gaps for this last several weeks and for the next month or so. We're going to be talking about how to bridge gaps, knowing and realizing that there are so many kinds of realities that are calling for a unique response by we, the people of God, but also a faithful response. And so uh, we're going to take a look at the biblical text today. This particular passage does come from the lectionary. Uh, it is a passage that many congregations all across the world, literally, who are uh, following the, the, the lectionary are actually preaching these series of passages. And we're going to go to the book of Romans, the book of Romans, chapter number 14. Um, it should be on the screen, I believe, as well. All right. Look at God. Amen. It's up there. And so if, you, if, you, if you'd like to follow along through your own text uh, that you have or on screen, certainly feel free. But the book of Romans was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, who was a piece of work all by himself. Amen. So that should give all you out there who are a piece of work a lot of hope. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I got what I needed today. Amen. I just got some hope. Amen. Mm. Paul was, 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 was a thug. Amen. If you, if you were want to use that, that kind of term, he was a, a very abusive, zealous, murdering guy. Paul's a piece of work. Now, hopefully, we don't have too many of y'all in here like that today. Man, not too many abusers, praise God. Not too many murderers, praise God. Amen. If you are those, I hope you're in recovery. And if you're not, amen, just lift your hand so I can come pray for you right now, right where you stand or sit. Um, but that Paul is one of these individuals who uh, was so taken by a radical encounter with Jesus, that every weakness he had through the power of God's strength became his strength. And every strength that he depended on through the power of God's strength became his weakness. Paul was one of these uh, early followers of Jesus who thought he had it all together until he was overwhelmed by an encounter with God. And that encounter changed Paul's whole life's trajectory. And so I want to submit to us that many of us have lots of gaps in our lives. There is a gap between who we are and who we want to be. Some of us have gaps between the hope and the despair in our lives. Some of us have gaps between the lovers and the haters in our lives. Some of us are literally teetering on the gap between life and death itself. And so this message hopefully today will give us some tools and maybe some things that can help you and I take seriously the opportunity we have to build a bridge over whatever gap it may be because God would not want you living on one side or the other. God wants you to keep going over those gaps to be who God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. So Romans chapter number 14 is where we'll spend our time today. Go ahead and uh, let's see what the scripture says. Uh, verse number one of chapter number 14, except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Amen. So I guess I am a problem. Amen. Here we go. Verse number three. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. What a great promise. Amen. Verse number five. One person considers one day more sacred than another, and another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their 
own mind. For whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord, and whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Verse 7, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Woo, man, that'll preach all by itself. I'll get there, amen, just give about 20 minutes, praise God. Verse number nine, for this very reason Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord, listen, of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister, or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat, and it is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another, Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk uh, from the topic, ride and die faith. Ride and die faith. Let's pray, everybody. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. Let us be read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Everybody say, ride and die. Ride and die. Faith. Now, it's so important to appreciate, as I stated earlier, that Paul's encounter with Jesus was so radical that it changed the very assumptions of who he was and the purpose he believed he was called to accomplish. I want to submit to you this morning that all of us are in need of a radical encounter with God. We come to church, we come to worship, go to the prayer meeting, you have your hopefully daily devotions, you do all kinds of volunteer work, or you do all kinds of, 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 of justice work, or ministry, or service. And how many of you know sometimes the routine of that work can rob you of the awareness of how sacred that work is. One of the great challenges, I think, we who are followers of Jesus, people of faith, etc., is that we can get so used to being in the presence of the uncreated one that we forget how we are supposed to continuously be transformed by that presence. And when you and I stop being transformed, we can easily fall back into habits, beliefs, assumptions that God is always trying to push us beyond. Because make no mistake about it, there is a way that seems right unto us, but the end is destruction, death, a hot mess. Anybody ever find themselves in a hot mess? All right, let me ask a different way. Any of you ever planned not to be in a mess and still found yourself in a mess? Mm-hmm. Amen. I, 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 you know, you, you signed up for the, for the financial planner, for the life coach, for the academic planning, 
And you did all the things that you thought you would do not to end up in a mess. And lo and behold, you look up and it ain't nothing but a mess. And so sometimes if you're like me or maybe others, you kind of, folk, you, especially if you're around, you know, haters, people who always like to point out that you in a mess as if you don't know you in a mess. <laughs> Anybody ever been around those kind of folk, right? It's like, it, it's obvious to the world that you got a limp or you, your leg just dragging and you just trying the best you can. You dress up the limp leg, you know, you put a nice shiny shoe and a bow on it, amen. And they're like, man, what's wrong with your leg? You're like, Tum. People always like to point out your idiosyncrasies without being invested in the process to get you to the other side. I don't know. I'm just, you know, thinking about my own life journey. <laughs> There's a whole lot of folk with a lot of free advice unsolicited wisdom. It's like, well, that's easy for you because you're not in this body, situation, circumstance. You know, it's like, why you do that? Why you do that? Well, why do you do what you do? Mm hmm You see, one of the great challenges you and I have, if we are going to live in community, if we're going to live in a, in a society of great diversity and, 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 and complexity, is that we have to become people who are able to give space to one another, to grow into who God is has destined us to be. I know you are looking good this morning. Your hair is done. Your, 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 your face is lined up. You worked out this week, so you, you all together. But how many of you know you still got a little ways to go? All right. Now, be afraid of the person who did not clap next to you about no display. No, you don't got to clap. Just, I hope you know you got, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, you got a long <laughs> way to go. <laughs> it's okay. See how everybody, we all agree. <laughs> now, when you come to the text here in the book of Romans, Paul is considered the apostle to the non-Jewish people of their day. Because when Jesus was around, Jesus was primarily hanging out with Jewish folk because, you know, it was pretty segregated back then. And now, you know, you find Jesus doing a few things with folk that weren't Jewish. And, you know, from time to time, it got Jesus in a little bit of trouble. But Jesus was built for that kind of trouble. And you built for that kind of trouble you about to get into. Amen. You built for it. So just come on. Fortify yourself. Because cause, cause God has built you for this. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus' ministry, although it, it was grounded in the life and the culture and the place of the Jews in the Roman Empire, the message of Jesus was appealing to everyone outside of that culture and, of course, now that place and time. And, 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 and Paul came on the scene as someone who was literally going around killing the Jews who followed and responded to the message of Jesus. And so Paul's response to this message at first was a terrible response. Now, can you imagine what it had been like if nobody told any other part of Paul's story? They just stopped. Paul's a murderer. All right, well, <laughs> all right, Paul, that's, that's it. Terrible guy. But how many know that God is not through, or God was not through with Paul? And because God was not through with Paul, Paul's worst mistakes became a testimony that could be used to help build a bridge across cultures. 
across time and across place. And so Paul writing to the church in Rome is because Paul realized that the message of the gospel, this radical encounter he had with God, compelled him to go beyond just one place. Now, appreciate this. Because the message of Jesus was grounded in a Jewish context, they had attached all of these things to the message of Jesus that Paul was now trying to disentangle. Because the Jewish culture was a kosher culture, meaning they had a whole list of food that they could eat and a whole list of food they could not eat. There were some Jewish Christians who were trying to pretty much tell the Gentiles that if you become a Christian, you have to adopt our diet. Or are you going to be one of those fake Christians, unfaithful Christians, sinny, sin, sin Christians? <laughs> they had another set of laws in the Jewish culture about what days they were supposed to worship on. And so there were some Jewish Christians that were telling the Gentiles or non-Jewish Christians, listen, when you become a Christian, you got to worship on this day. Or you are an unfaithful Christian, a fake Christian, a sinny, sin, sin Christian. And there was this tug of war that was going on in the early church around what does it really mean to follow Jesus faithfully in this culture and time and place? And I think the scriptures, the overwhelming weight of scripture, and certainly the history of our tradition teaches us one important truth, is that we all are growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that if you are following Jesus, you will always be mobile in your faith. Hello, somebody. The moment you park in a particular faith place, I want to submit to you that you are robbing yourself of an opportunity to explore the magnanimity of God's great grace. You know, there's a reason why that song, Amazing Grace, is just so popular to everybody. Because I think it is a eternal principle truth that the grace of God is amazing. It is an unearned blessing. Yes. Nothing you could do could make you qualify for the gift of God's grace. And so rather than trying to earn something you could never earn, why don't you just be who God has called you to be? And in your being, you may stumble into more amazing grace, the kind of grace you need day by day by day. And when you look at our world, I continue to be reminded that these gaps are real. These gaps of culture, of race, of equity, of fairness, of justice, it's real. Some of our comrades are in town this week from St. Louis. They left right before they announced another verdict where a police officer was caught on video calling this young man, the N-word, and saying he's going to kill him. And I think 45 seconds later, the young man was shot six times, center mass, in his car. And they found the gun in there, but the gun didn't have any DNA of the young man, but all the DNA of the officer. And the judge this week said that he was not convinced that the officer killed this young man with premeditation. And what was even more disturbing to me about this verdict was that the judge said 
that in all his years of being a judge, it would be an anomaly for a heroin dealer to not have a gun. And I read that and I just shuddered because it did a couple things to me. On the, the, the civil rights side of the equation, it started to feel like this judge was making case law for suspects to be killed first based off of who they are perceived to be very troubling. Then I realized that this judge also had a gap in his own ability to discern the truth. That one person's heroin dealer, in my experience, is also a user. And it's fascinating because a whole part of our country is enthralled in a opiate heroin crisis. And unless the heroin is falling from the sky, like manna from heaven, somebody up in the northeastern part of the United States of America is selling and dealing some heroin. But I don't see them shooting heroin <laughs> users, addicts, or dealers in New Hampshire and Maine and Ohio. <laughs> there seems to be some empathy that those who find themselves caught in addiction perhaps need not lethal force to help address their challenge, but they may need peaceful force, healing force, redemptive force. Where there is no empathy, you are more prone to move to lethal responses. Now, that works well for all of us who got a problem with the criminal justice system, et cetera, but I want you to think about how easy it is for us to dehumanize, criminalize, and invisibilize people who we don't like. One of the great challenges of this moment, I believe, is that we have a culture that is drenched in a othering sensibility where if you are not like me, then I don't consider you fully my responsibility. And what's so challenging about this, particularly as I've done a little bit of research and study about genocides and whatnot, is that before genocides happen, you have to dehumanize that group of people. You have to make people think that they are less than human so when their lives are taken or oppressed, you are slow to respond because you don't believe they are your responsibility to take care of. This is kind of what I believe was at risk here in the biblical text. Paul was understanding that if we are living in an empire, called the Roman Empire, and we are trying to be brothers, sisters, loved ones, a Christian community, I can't allow the differences we have to cause you to be considered not my responsibility. <laughs> now, again, that works for the people you like. <laughs> Man. Folk that you like, the folk that look like you, like what you like, like your same teens, praise God. Same kind of music, live in your neighborhood. That's easy. Oh, yes, don't you touch them or you're going to have to deal with me. But how many know 
we got a responsibility beyond our circle of friends and family. And so when Paul brings this conversation up, Paul is basically challenging that your faith must be so transformative that it makes you willing to ride for that person. He didn't say ride. He said live, but you know. <laughs> it, it, it should make you willing to go the extra mile for that person. And listen, it should make you be willing to die to some things that get in the way of that person experiencing the fullness of their dignity and divine imprint in their life. Again, I, 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 I try to believe that as Christians, we're called to something a little different than everybody else. This don't mean that everybody else shouldn't do it. But I want to submit to you that if you follow Jesus, you don't get to pick and choose who you like. And it's hard, Lord Jesus, there's some folk right now <laughs> that I be praying like Jesus was in the, in the garden. Can this cup pass from me? Take it away. Take them away. Just blink your eyes and just either let me not be able to see them or some, just do something. Anybody got one or two folk like that in your life? Amen. It's all right to tell the truth while you in church. <laughs> there are a few folk that just get on your nerves. And you got to fast and pray. Just to keep from knocking them upside the head. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's true. Hopefully we're not prone to violence. But how I many you know there are some folk that they just kind of know how to push a button. And get you all out of sorts. Mm -hmm. And so as a follower of Jesus, the scripture tells us all kind of commands about what we're supposed to do. Oh, I love this one. It says, as much as was, is within you, follow peace with everyone and holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. As much as is within you. Think about that. As much as is within you. That means that you have the potential to get more in you. Well, this is as far as I can go. No, that's as far as you willing to go. <laughs> How many of you know God can put a supernatural power inside you that'll make you go further than you thought you could go? And that's what we are called to be reaching for. When we come into worship, when we come into study, when we come into prayer, we're not coming just to handle the sacred in a sacrilegious manner. But we're coming to ask God, give me more of what I don't have. <laughs> Knowing that that more that I need will come from you. It ain't going to come from me. As much as I want to love everybody, my love has limits. And so does yours. <laughs> but how many of you know we serve a God who has everlasting love? Woo. Which just means that that love lasts forever. And if that love lasts forever, guess what? You have access to everlasting love. Love. The other text that we, we didn't get, we're not going to get a chance to go to today is a text that talks about how uh, uh, if, if, if you have to forgive your brother or your sister, 70 times 7. And it goes on to say, this is the most troubling scripture in the whole Bible for me. <laughs> it's troubling. <laughs> that if you don't forgive them, your heavenly Father in heaven won't forgive you. Woo, that scripture keeps me up at night. 
Because there's some folk that I just, I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm not there. <laughs> I know I'm not, and so I'm just, Lord, I start speaking in tongues. I just start doing all kind of stuff. Rolling on, on the floor, looking for a chandelier, hoping to levitate. Any Pentecostal trick I can muster. <laughs> because there's some folk in my life that push my nerves so bad. And when I see them, my blood pressure goes up, and I start sweating, and I have thoughts, and I just know ain't nothing but the devil working. Just trying to paint a picture for you today. <laughs> and so what does the scripture tell us that we have to do? The first thing is that you and I have to listen if we're going to build bridges we have to work on welcoming one another. Somebody say, welcoming. Welcome. Tell your neighbor, you got to be more welcoming. You have to learn how to welcome people who are different than you. Somebody just lift your hands and holler, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling. As a child of God, you are operating from a position of strength. It is the assumption in the power relationship. Why? Because you have access to a bottomless well of virtue. That through the power of God's spirit, you can always make a withdrawal or deposit. Are you hearing me today? So you and I have to figure out, Lord, what are the tactics and the tools and the practices I must employ in real time? So when I am dealing with some folk that I don't like, I can tap in immediately to the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the forgiveness, the hope, the, the faith that is within my reach if I employ the practices. The problem with many of us as followers of Jesus is that our only practice we have is coming to church on Sunday. So it's like, if I'm not in church, all bets are off now. <laughs> all right? I better take this church. I better put it in my pocket. Because if I run into them, boy, it's about to be a problem. Unless we at church. Then I'll just cut my eyes at you from across the room. But how many of you know the church ain't this building? You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I, we are the church. And so you got to have practices that follow you out that door. Or you will not be the kind of church. We will not be the kind of church that gives glory to God even when the music's not playing. That reflects on the word of God even when the preacher's not preaching. That pushes for the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven even when the injustice is seemingly expanding. We must be the church and the way we become the church is to practice tapping in to the strength that we have. Now, in order to welcome folk, I think there's a couple things you got to appreciate. Number one, you have privilege. That you and I have to always be assessing. Mm -hmm. Whew, privilege. What a difficult thing to struggle with. I was disturbed this week by Kanika Jenkins, who was found in a freezer dead. And the tragedy of that in and of itself with two daughters, certainly my wife, and all these uh, 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 women that I love in my life, the, the vulnerability of women's bodies. That also keeps me up at night. Every 21 hours, a woman is killed. Not by strangers, but by people they know. Think about that. 
every 21 hours, someone kills a woman that they know. I was talking with a, a, a dear friend of mine. We're starting some work together around healing. And she was saying that as she's raising her son, she is realizing how she has to train her son not to be a good man, but how not to be a rapist. I sat there. We was at Lois the Pie Queen. I think I almost choked on my grits or something. <laughs> I said, what? And she began to lay out all of these ways. And we talked about this with our toxic masculinity stuff uh, last year or so, that unfortunately masculinity has shaped so many of us to just abuse, take what is not ours. Right? And, you know, I had no brothers, so I was like, oh, here we go, beating up on the men again. I'm just telling you now, if the shoe fits, wear it. Like Uncle Johnny say, if it don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> the idea that women all in this room are so vulnerable is deeply troubling to me. And so as we were looking at this, as I was reading and having some conversations about this, I saw a lot of church people's pages, you know, friends of mine who are Christian, and they immediately went to talking about she bore some responsibility because she picked the wrong friends, or she was doing things that were not wise, and on and on and on and on. And, 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 and I, 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 I bristled because I said to myself, we should not have to put a burden of perfection upon any of us in order to expect our right to live. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to one of my, my partners, a fella, he was on, going on, on and on and on about it. I said, well, I think that's easy for you to say because we men. And so, you know, I think we should ec realize that there's some privilege there that we got to be willing to check a little bit, or maybe a lot, depending on how much you can take at one time. <laughs> Praise God. That in order to truly welcome people, we have to be aware of our privilege and how that privilege colors the world in which we live. And there's all kind of privilege you and I have. You can be the poorest of the poor in America, and you still got American privilege. Hello, somebody. You can be a Christian in America oppressed, and you still got Christian privilege. Now, what does that mean? That just means that if we're going to welcome people, we have to be aware that our welcoming does not become a conscious or unconscious way for us to do harm to other folks. So if I am going to welcome folk, I got to ask myself some questions. Who am I being called to welcome? Who are the different people in my life that God has placed me around again? How many of y'all around people that are not like you? Anyone? Work with them. They in your family. In your house, praise God. <laughs> it's like, oh, Pastor, I got that. Oh, oh. <laughs> and you got to practice welcoming them. How many of you don't need the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Some of y'all. Like, I need all the help I can get. Because these folk right here, boy. But you have access to the power of God that can allow you to do that. Let's hit this first question because I'm, I'm getting carried away here. Are there people in your life you are being compelled to ride for as you welcome them? So if you're going to build some bridges from whatever place you are to the next place, I want to submit that you can't get to your next destination unless you become a better welcoming person. 
Could it be that your progress is directly connected to how welcoming you can be? I can welcome folk and not agree with them. There are a whole lot of folk I don't agree with. But that don't mean I got to be mean, nasty, don't consider them to be my responsibility to make sure that they have the opportunity at the best life that they can have. I don't have to agree with them. Shoot, I don't agree with myself half the time. I tell folk all the time, I am sure of what I'm sure of until I'm not so sure. <laughs> and the truth is, we are all changing. Hello, somebody. At least I hope you're changing. I think if you're not changing, you're going to be by yourself for a little while. So what does it mean for you to ride for some folk? And listen, if you can't welcome them, what has to die inside of you so you can be a better welcoming person? Paul had such an encounter with God. That it changed his whole worldview. I want to submit that your encounter with God must be so real that you have the ability to welcome folk. You have the ability to figure out who those folk are and what you must do. And you also have the ability to realize, man, there's some things in me that are getting in the way of me welcoming these gifts that God has placed in my life. Because even those that get on your nerves have the potential to be a gift. The other text that we can't get to today is in Genesis. Joseph was confronting Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery. And Joseph's encounter with God allowed Joseph to repackage what he was going through. And said, what you meant for evil, God is using it for our good. Ooh. Can you imagine there's some people who mean you harm? But God has a way of taking even their worst intentions and turning it around to bless you and them. Lord, have mercy. In the process, those folk who mean you harm, God says, if you just hold your peace, let me fight this battle. Not only will I deliver you, but I'm going to bring them to a different place so they won't keep doing harm to somebody else. Hallelujah. There's all kind of possibility for the God who can do anything but fail. But the question for us is will we tap into the depth, the endless, bottomless well? of virtues that give us the ability to go beyond and build that bridge. Second thing, Lord, have mercy, my time is moving. My, my, my time is moving. Second thing that, 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 that you and I are going to have to be aware of is that we have to listen. If we're going to build bridges, have conversions. Somebody say Conversions. That's with an S. Mm -hmm. I'm already saved, Pastor Mike. I didn't ask you that. Matter of fact, while that is great, you are already converted. Where else must you be converted? This passage alone will preach all day long. We do not live to ourselves. We do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. How many of you know that the rest of your life is about you having conversions, moments of transformation, moments where you are being Move from one place of truth to another. One place of truth to another. 
There was a time in my life I did not believe God could handle that. That was my truth. Now I believe God can handle almost everything. Hopefully before I die, it'll be everything. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody. He's like, oh, Pastor Mike, you need more faith. I'm learning that I don't want to uh, what do you write a check that my faith can't cash yet. <laughs> Hello, somebody. That's why confession is so important. Amen. You sitting around here, just you know, like like Peter. Jesus, I'm never gonna leave you. I'm I'm a ride or die with you, Jesus. I wish somebody would walk up on you, Jesus. I got some for I got some for him. Soon as Peter got up outnumbered, he over here like, whew. <laughs> he said, ain't you Jesus, homeboy? No, 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 no. No, I didn't. You know, I got a doppelganger around here somewhere. <laughs> we say all the stuff we gonna do till we get into it. Oh, I'm through with this relationship. This relationship over. I've had enough. He, she, they, them, those, I'm through. <laughs> you hear the right song, you smell the right smoke, you in the, and all of a sudden you find yourself like, oh man. <laughs> you ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I know he's telling me the truth today, man. <laughs> Anybody said you was done? I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Then all of a sudden you like, one more chance. <laughs> one more chance. We don't know what we won't do until you get in the situation. And that's why you should have a little, you know, there are all these people out here telling all the protesters or 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 you know uh 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 uh, uh, police officers or, 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 or the president or whatever. Oh, this is what they should do. I tell them, well, when you get there, then I'll listen. But I want to be a nonviolent person. But I don't know what I'm going to do if you crack me upside my head. I hope I'm nonviolent. Lord knows I do. But something may snap. I don't know. I hope not. Hello, somebody. In the, in the civil rights protest, there were all kind of folk out there committed to nonviolence. And then when things went sideways, not everybody was able to keep their principles. My dad used to make us watch Eyes on a Prize and the dolls was being stuck on folk. You had some folk who would take it. You had other folks who start kicking a dog, punching a cop. Because their principles were not tested in the moment of adversity. Our police officers, the president, all these different folk, everybody say what they're going to do till they get there. So you don't know what you're going to do <laughs> now. <laughs> but you can prepare yourself with these moments of conversions. Lord, help me to be faithful. And when I'm not faithful, help me to do a few things. This is good things for you to write down. Repent when I'm wrong. Meaning say I'm sorry. Let's just practice that. Because I know as Christ followers, we don't like to say we sorry. <laughs> but everybody say I'm sorry. sorry. We don't say it at least two more times. So all you didn't say it the first time, you get two more chances. <laughs> Somebody say I'm sorry. Now look at the person next to you and just practice. Look at them and just tell them, I am sorry. How many know as people of God, we have to practice, we have to practice the liberatory and salvific truths that have been handed down to us. That helps you with these conversion 
moments. We don't live to ourselves. We don't die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Again, the question you just have to answer is if you are riding for, living for, you must be making sure you're living for that which brings glory to God and liberation and freedom to you and those around you. If you are dying to, you must make sure that you are having these conversion moments where you can be honest about the things that you must release for your own good, for the good of those around you, and to the glory of God. And I have found that when I realize, man, God, you're asking me to die to my ego, die to my arrogance, die to my anger, die to my selfishness, that is a conversion moment. That is real. It is, it is almost as significant as the moment you gave your life to Jesus. And you can wake up to those parts of you that must die. And then you have the courage to let it die. So something else can grow in its place. <laughs> Jesus, help us. That's what we must do, church. And right now, nobody wants to die to themselves. They want to stay the same. But I want to submit to you that we who believe in resurrection must never become intimidated by death in any form. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us from the dead. Whatever dead situation you are in, it is a temporary situation. Oh, my God, today. Anybody got any temporary situations that you need God to resurrect you from? You've been depressed. You've been oppressed. You've been isolated. You've been forgotten. You, you felt like all hope was gone, and yet one day in the middle of your worst moment, God said, arise. This is the expectation for we, the children of God. And that's why you got to keep converting. God, help me to keep converting. Help me to not be someone who gets so locked into who I am today. Who you are today is not that impressive. I know they give you all the nice little, you know, commercials and, and yet you read your own press clippings. But how many of you know you know when you by yourself the things you struggle with? You know how hard it is to love your partner. You know how hard it is to forgive yourself or, 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 or to, to, to embrace that problem in your, in your child or in your family. You know how hard it is to show up to work and give your best when you feel you're exploited. You know how hard it is to live in a country that literally is killing you every day. So don't get too high on the hog that you forget that God is still working to turn you from who you are today, from who we are today, to who God requires us to be in the faithfulness of God's call. Hallelujah, I feel like preaching. Let, 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 the, 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 the next thing, the question in, are you living for a higher purpose? Listen, if it is indeed the case that to live or to die, is nothing but an extension of your connection to God, then I want you to wrestle with this truth that you must be living, whether you're living or dying, you must live with a higher purpose in mind. 
that I will not be shackled to the ground when God has called me to live in heavenly places. That I will not allow my mind to be preoccupied with the limitations of this moment when God has given me eternity to reach for and to bring into my moment and my time. I'm here to tell you that you and I must walk every day with a elevated imagination, a heavenly mindset where you are not responding with what you were taught on the street or in your dysfunctional relationship or in your abusive home, but you got some elevated principles from the word of God that teach you and show you and demand you to live with a heavenly, divine response. Are you then living with a higher purpose in mind? Where are you being challenged to die so you can live? How must you be converted? The last thing I'll tell to you is that if we're going to build these bridges, guess what? You got to get rid of some stumbling blocks. And how many of you know that sometimes the stumbling blocks are us? You can be in your own way. Or you can be in someone else's way. And one of the great challenges we find if we're going to build a bridge is that we often compare ourselves to one another. And it goes back to the thing about privilege we were talking about earlier. Too, too, too often we think that we are in competition with one another. But I am not in competition with you. And you are not in competition with me. If we're in competition ever, it is who can outlove one another, who can outserve one another, who can outforgive one another, who can remove the stumbling blocks and the obstacles that life has placed in the way of one another. And I want you and I to be very committed to this truth. You can't judge what you don't understand. And that's why God is always the ultimate judge. Because God has been there from the beginning. I just met you last week. So I don't know why you like you are. I got some ideas. <laughs> Touch your neighbor somebody. I done seen this picture before. How many know God was there from the beginning? God knows what made you turn left. God knows what straightened you back out. God knows what made that zigzag up and down, side to side, around the mulberry bush, into the pit, up to the palace. God knows your whole story. I only know where I entered the story at. Our 12, 13 years of ministry, we've met people while they was in the palace and while they was in the pit. And early on, I used to be so excited. Oh, thank God, finally got some palace dwelling folk. Then I met some folk in the pit, and I'd be like, oh, God bless you, baby. We gonna bring you, help you get on up. And the more I've lived, I've realized there is a fluidity to the pit and the palace. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You can get so low that you'll show up for any kind of help you want. Any kind of help you can get. And you get so high that you show up like, hey, you know, I'm here to pop my collar. Everybody know that I'm all right. But as soon as you start hitting that downward spiral, you'll disappear. And then I met folks, as soon as they hit that upward spiral, they disappear. And the only thing I have great thanksgiving about is that God was there with them before I got there, and God will be there with them after they leave. <laughs> Think about this for a second. Everyone, 90-some percent of the people that are in your life are there temporarily. So the question is, how will you be to those God brings in your life? Will you be a stumbling block? Will you be someone who does harm? 
to them. It could be marriage. It could be girlfriend, boyfriend. It could be children, fathers, mothers, ace spoon coons, homies, study partners, church friends, club friends. It could be whatever kind of whatever relationship you want. Most of these relationships we are in are temporary. I mean, I guess I can say all of them. Because when you die, and I've done a lot of funerals, only a few I've seen them hop in the casket with them, overwhelmed by grief. But when that top gets closed, even the grief starts to dissipate enough where they get out the casket. It's like, all right, now you got to go this journey on your own. <laughs> Hello, somebody. It's, it's not meant to be, you know, insensitive. It is meant to drive home that our relationships are temporary. Your relationship with God is eternal, though. So the question you must answer, God, how does my eternal relationship with you necessitate me not being a stumbling block to this other person who you are eternally in relationship with this way? Because, you know, sometimes we think, oh, it's just me and Jesus. I don't know what the rest of y'all got going on, but, you know, me and Jesus. Jesus answered my prayer. He don't hear your prayer. No, no, G Jesus hear both y'all's prayers and how foolish they are. <laughs> kind of like when I hear my daughters, I hear Nala start crying. Hey! And then I'm like, what happened? Nala comes in. Sarai hit me upside the head. And then Sarai comes in. I said, what happened? She was trying to grab my toy out of my hand. And when I pushed her hand away, my hand hit her head. And, you know, <laughs> then after five minutes of that, y'all you know, go back in your room, please. That's how God responded to some of your prayers. <laughs> go back in your room, please. <laughs> this can't be serious. Hello, somebody. God, do this to them. God, do that to them. Make this happen to them. God, like, go back in your room. <laughs> and you better be thankful about that because you got someone else on this side praying the same prayer for you. You go back in your room, too. You come to me when you're willing to intercede on their behalf. You come to me when you're willing to ask forgiveness, ask for more grace and love. That's when God will say, stay right here in my presence so I can give you that well that never runs dry. That's what God is calling for you and I to do. Not pray for your enemies to be destroyed so they don't have a chance to be converted. God is asking the church, pray for your enemies. Even Donald Trump with his old white supremacist crazy narcissistic self. I'm praying for all kind of conversions for that one, praise God. Listen, and you better be praying for it too. I'm here to tell you. We, people of God, followers of Jesus, we don't get to pick and choose the bridges we are called to build. Where there is a gap, we are called to build the bridge. So you in your own life, Lord, what are the gaps? I have a gap of hopelessness. Give me the divine power to build this bridge. I have a gap of animus. Give me the materials and the power I need to build this bridge. My faith is weak. It's, 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 it's lacking. Give me what I need to build this bridge. But don't let me stay stuck on one side of my journey when I got all of this that you have ordained for me to experience. Don't get trapped in your sin, in your pain, in your confusion, in your behavior. Ask God, help me to build this bridge. 
God is able. Are you hearing me today? God is able to build the bridge in your life. You don't have to stay on one side of a journey when God is trying to get you to the next place. Because on that other side, there's more ministry. There's more exploits. There's more growing and learning and joy and healing and wholeness. Come on, stand just for a few moments and lift up your hands. As you lift your hands, ask God right now, Lord, help me to build this bridge. Help me to build this bridge because I realize there are some places I must go. There's some experiences that I must encounter and there's some lessons I must learn. There's some challenges I must conquer. And this bridge is necessary for my formation. I lift my hands to you because I realize that I am nothing without you. I'm less than who I can be without you. I don't want to be locked into a place of stagnant, stale position. But God, may I be dynamic, mobile. May my faith, hallelujah, Propel me forward. Because God, I need you to heal what's broken. Save what's lost. In the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you say, I need this kind of a Ride and die faith. I need to have such an encounter with God that my faith helps me to ride for and die too. My faith encounter needs to be so real that it decenters that which has me in bondage and it places at the center that which can free that which can heal, that which can correct. If that's you. Lift your hands right where you are. Come on. I see those hands. I am not the same. Lift those hands. Lift those hands. I've been changed.